Um, so possibly initially done as like a, on, a, on a sort of toll road type basis. Yeah. Which I guess alleviates some traffic from the surface streets as well. So I think I don't know if people noticed it in the video, but there's no real limit to how many levels of, tr of tunnel you can have. So you can go much further deep than you can go up. The deepest mines are much deeper than the tallest buildings are tall. So you can alleviate any arbitrary level of urban congestion uh, with, with the 3D tunnel network. This is a very important point. So a key rebuttal to the tu tunnels is that if you add uh, one layer of tunnels, then that will simply alleviate congestion, it'll get used up, and, and, and then you'll be back where you started, back with congestion. But you can go to any arbitrary number of tunnels, any number of levels. But people seem traditionally it's, it's incredibly expensive to dig, and that would block this idea. Yeah. Um, well, they're, they're right. To give you an example, the LA subway extension, uh, which is, a, I think it's a two and a half mile extension, that was just completed for two billion dollars. So it's roughly a billion dollars a mile to do the, the subway extension in, in LA. And, and this is not the highest utility subway in the world. Um, so, it, yeah, it's quite difficult to dig tunnels normally. I think we need to have at least a tenfold improvement in the cost per mile of tunneling. And how could you achieve that? I guess, uh, actually, if, if you just do two things, you can get to approximately an order of magnitude improvement, uh, and, and I think you can go beyond that. So the, the first thing to do is to cut the tunnel, tunnel diameter uh, by a factor of two or more. So, to, so a single road lane tunnel, would, uh, uh, according to regulations, has to be 26 feet, maybe 28 feet in diameter to allow for crashes and emergency vehicles um, and sufficient ventilation uh, for uh, combustion engine cars. But if you, if you shrink that diameter to what, what we're attempting, which is 12 feet, which is plenty to get an electric skate through, uh, you drop the, uh, the diameter by a factor of two and the cross-sectional area by, by a factor of four, so, uh, and the, the tunneling cost scales with the cross-sectional area. So that's roughly a half-order of magnitude improvement right there. Then tunneling machines uh, currently tunnel for half the time, then they stop, and then the, the rest of the time is putting in reinforcements for the tunnel wall. So if you, have, if you design the machine instead to do continuous tunneling and reinforcing, that'll give you a factor of two improvement. Combine that, and it's a factor of eight. Uh, also, these machines are far from at being at their, their power or thermal limit. So you can jack up the power to the machine substantially. I think you can get at least a factor of two, maybe a, a factor of four or five improvement on, the, on top of that. So I, I think the, it, there's a, a fairly straightforward series of steps to get uh, somewhere in excess of an order of magnitude improvement in a cost per mile. Um, and um, our, our target, actually, is we've got a pet snail called Gary. Um, this is from Gary the Snail from South Park. <laughs> I mean, sorry, um, SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, <laughs> so, so Gary uh, is, is capable uh, of, of, currently, he's capable of going 14 times faster than, than, than a tunnel boring machine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You, you so want to beat Gary? We want to beat Gary. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's not a patient little fellow, and we want the, to, that will be victory. Victory is beating the snail. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people imagining, dreaming about future cities, they imagine that actually the solution is, is um, sort of flying cars, drones, etc. You, you, you go above ground. Um, why isn't that a better solution? You save all that tunneling cost. Right. I, I'm in favor of flying things. Obviously, I do rockets, so I, I like things that fly. This is not some inherent bias against flying things. But th th there is a challenge with flying cars in that they, they'll be quite noisy, uh, the, the wind force generated will be very high. Uh, they, th there's, um, let's just say that if something's flying over your head, if, if there are a whole bunch of flying cars going all over the place, um, that is not an anxiety-reducing uh, <laughs> situation. Um, you don't think to yourself, well, I feel better about today. Um, <laughs> you're thinking, like, did they service their hubcap? Or is it going <laughs> to come off and guillotine me as they're flying past? Um, and so, so, you're, so you've got this vision, then, future cities with these, these rich 3D networks of, of tunnels, Underneath, is there a tie-in here with with Hyperloop? Could you apply these tunnels to use for this Hyperloop idea you had, you released a few years ago? Yeah. So, um, 
You know, we've been sort of puttering around with the Hyperloop stuff for um, for a while. We, we built a Hyperloop test track adjacent to SpaceX just for a student competition uh, to encourage innovative ideas in transport. Um, it actually ends up being the uh, the, the biggest um, vacuum chamber in the world after the Large Hadron Collider uh, by by volume. So. Um, so, so it, it, was, it was sort of quite, quite fun to do that, um, but it was kind of a hobby thing. And, and then um, we, we think we might... So we developed a little pusher car to push the, 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 the student pods, um, but we're going to try seeing how fast we can make the, the pusher go if it's not pushing something. <laughs> so, I mean, like, sort of cautiously optimistic we'll be able to be faster than a... Uh, in the, in the world's fastest bullet train, even in, in a 0.8-mile stretch. Whoa. Um, Good break. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah. It's either going to smash into tiny pieces or... But you can, you can, picture, you can picture, then, a Hyperloop in a tunnel g yes. running quite, quite long distances. Exactly. So, so, in looking at tunneling technology, it turns out that in order to make a tunnel, you have to... Uh, ha in order to seal against the water table, uh, you've got to typically design a tunnel wall to be uh, a, a good to about five or six atmospheres. Um, so to go to vacuum is only one atmosphere, hmm. or near vacuum. So uh, actually, it, it, it sort of turns out that automatically, if you build a tunnel that is good enough to resist the water table, it is automatically capable of holding vacuum. Huh. So, yeah. And so, so you can actually picture this, like, well, like what, what kind of length tunnel do you, is, is in Elon's future to running Hyperloop? Yeah, I, th I think there's no, there's no real length limit. Uh, you, could, you, could, you could dig as much as you want. Um, I, I think the, like, if you were to do something like um, a DC to New York uh, Hyperloop, I think you'd probably want to go underground the entire way because it's a high-density area. That there's, you're going, you're going um, under a lot of buildings and houses, and if you go deep enough, you cannot detect the tunnel. Um, this is, sometimes people think, well, it's going to be pretty annoying to have a tunnel dug under my house. Like, if that tunnel is dug more than about three or four tunnel diameters beneath your house, you will not be able to detect it being dug at all. Huh. Um, in, fa in fact, like the, um, if, you, if you're able to detect the tunnel being, being dug, you, whatever device you're using, you can get a lot of money for that device from the Israeli military, who is trying to detect tunnels from Hamas. Um, <laughs> and uh, from the U.S. Uh, Customs and Border Patrol that are trying to detect drug tunnels. So uh, if you, the, the reality is that uh, Earth is incredibly good at absorbing vibrations, and once the tunnel depth is below a certain level, it is undetectable. It, maybe if you have a very sensitive seismic instrument, you might be able to detect it. So you've started a new company to do this called The Boring Company. Very nice, very, right. very funny. Um, but how, what's funny how, about that? How, how, um, <laughs> um, how much of your time is this? It's, it's, um, it's maybe two or three percent. You've, you've bought it a hobby. This is, this is what an Elon Musk hobby looks like. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Like, we actually, you know, this is basically interns and people doing it part time. So this is. <laughs> Um, like, we bought, like we bought, you know, um, some second-hand machinery, and it's just, it's kind of puttering along, but it's making good progress, so... So an even uh, bigger part of your time is being spent on, on um, electrifying cars and transport through Tesla. Um, is, is one of the motivations for the, for the tunneling project the realization that actually, in a world where cars are electric and where they're, they're self-driving, there may end up being more cars on the roads on any given hour yeah. than there are now. Yeah, the, the, exactly. The <clears throat> a, a lot of people think that once, when you make cars autonomous, that they'll be able to go faster and that will alleviate congestion. Um, and to some degree, that will be true. Uh, but once you have shared autonomy, where it's much cheaper to go by car, and you can go point to point, um, the affordability of of going in a car will be, will be better than that of a bus. Like, it would cost less than a bus ticket. So, um, the amount of driving that will occur will be much greater with shared autonomy, and actually traffic will get far worse. I mean, you, you started Tesla with the, with the goal of, of persuading the world 
to that electrification was the future of cars. Yes. And a few years ago, people were laughing at you. Now, But, not so much. I mean. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, isn't I it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe some, but isn't it true that <laughs> isn't it true that pretty much every auto manufacturer has announced serious electrification plans for the m short to medium term future? Uh, yeah, yeah. The um, the I, I think almost every automaker has has some electric vehicle program. They vary in seriousness. Some some are very serious about transitioning entirely to electric, um, and some are just dabbling in it. Um, And some, amazingly, are still pursuing fuel cells, but I think that won't last much longer. But is, isn't there isn't there a sense, though, Elon, where you, you you could now just declare victory and say, you know, we did it. Let 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 the world electrify, and you go on and focus on other stuff. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I intend to stay with Tesla as as far into the future as I can imagine. Um, and uh, there are a lot of exciting things that we have coming. Uh, we've got um, obviously the Model 3 that's coming soon. Uh, we'll be unveiling the uh, Tesla semi truck. Um, and okay, maybe... well, we're going we're to come yeah. to this. So, okay. so, so Model 3. So it's coming. It's supposed to be coming in July-ish. Yeah, it, it's looking quite good for starting production in July. Yeah. Wow. Um, one of the things that people are so excited about is is the fact that it, it's um, it's got autopilot, and um, you you put out this video a while back showing what that um, What that technology looked sure. like, or would look like. Yeah. Um, there's obviously autopilot in Model S right now. Yeah. What, what are we seeing here? Yeah. So this is um, using only cameras and a GPS. So there's no lidar or radar being used here. This is just using passive optical, which is essentially what a person uses. Um, the, the whole road system is meant to be navigated with uh, passive optical or, or cameras, and so. Once you solve cameras uh, or vision, uh, then autonomy is solved. If you don't solve vision, it's not solved. So that, that's why our focus is so heavily on having a, a vision.